It seems trivial to most people that medications, including those available over the counter, could cause unwanted side effects in some people. It's also taken for granted that to resolve these side effects, all that's needed is to simply discontinue the perpetrating medication. But what if the side effects don't resolve themselves? What if instead they continue for years or even indefinitely? This is a situation not as readily acknowledged, and yet it's the reality for a great many people treated with certain medications, including SSRIs. For most people, this class of antidepressants are well tolerated and effective. However, a minority of patients suffer a spectrum of lasting changes to their health and mental well-being. Whilst there's some degree of individual variation in these symptoms, the most typical complaint is a feeling of anhedonia, or the inability to feel pleasure. Perhaps just as troubling as the symptoms themselves is the apparent inability by doctors to explain why these side effects can persist so long after the drug has fully metabolized out of the body. Whilst this condition may appear to be mysterious to both patients and practitioners, the science underlying it is actually fairly well understood, and in this video I'll attempt to present the science in a way that's easily comprehensible. I'll start with an introduction as to how SSRIs are meant to work. The 5-HT1A receptor is a type of serotonin receptor, which means it's bound by the neurotransmitter serotonin to exert its effects. Serotonin has long had connotations to happiness, stemming from early scientific evidence that the depletion of serotonin results in depressive symptoms. SSRIs boost the effect of serotonin by preventing it from being reabsorbed too quickly by the serotonin transporter. However, since SSRIs were first introduced, medical paradigms have shifted in favour of theories of depression centred on neurogenesis, that is, the growth of new neurons. The 1A receptors are inhibitory receptors, evidenced by a reduction in amper evoked currents when bound by serotonin, AMPA being the receptors responsible for fast synaptic transmission. In essence, binding to the 1A receptor suppresses the activity of those neurons. The receptor can be subdivided into two types, the heteroreceptor and the autoreceptor. The difference between these two subtypes results in vastly different regional effects in response to serotonin. The autoreceptor is present on the serotonin neurons within the RAFE nuclei, and the release of serotonin from these neurons exerts a self-limiting effect. Serotonin binds these autoreceptors to inhibit the further release of serotonin in a negative feedback loop. The postsynaptic heteroreceptors are distributed in the limbic and cortical regions. The limbic system is responsible for emotion, learning, and libido. Like the autoreceptor, binding at the 1A heteroreceptor triggers hyperpolarization of that neuron, thereby lowering the firing rate. Based on the description provided so far, one might conclude that selectively binding to the heteroreceptor will produce the same reduction in neuronal activity in the cortex. The reality is much more complicated, as the heteroreceptors are present on two different types of neuron which have opposing effects, the interneurons and the pyramidal neurons. The interneurons are primarily GABAergic, which means they have their own inhibitory effect through the neurotransmitter GABA. Conversely, the pyramidal neurons release the excitatory neurotransmitters such as glutamate and dopamine, and are particularly abundant in the cerebral cortex. This makes them key in mediating feelings of reward. Understanding how binding to the 1A heteroreceptor will impact mood therefore depends on the relationship between these opposing sets of neurons. Consider a hypothetical medication that very selectively targets the heteroreceptor at the interneuron. By lowering the transmission of GABA, it would in fact disinhibit dopamine and glutamate in the cortex, rather than simply having a suppressive effect. So what's more important understanding the role of the heteroreceptor, the interneuron or the pyramidal neuron? This is answered with a medication called flibanserin, which is used to treat hyposexual disorders in women. This medication enhances neurotransmitters linked to rewards such as neuroadrenaline and dopamine in the prefrontal cortex. This is on account of preferentially binding to the heteroreceptors on the interneurons, and thereby lowering the transmission of the inhibitory neurotransmitter GABA, which then disinhibits the pyramidal neurons. Now back to SSRIs. The purported goal of SSRIs is to elevate the presence of serotonin within the RAFE nuclei by blocking the action of the serotonin transporter. Initially, this will trigger the negative feedback mechanism of the autoreceptor, which would limit further serotonin release. However, after chronic application, these receptors become desensitized and no longer have an inhibitory effect. A key feature of G-protein coupled receptors like 5-HT1A is that they undergo a process of receptor internalization after prolonged periods of activation. 
So this in theory would allow for more serotonin to reach the heteroceptor sites and exert beneficial effects on mood and cognition. However, more recent evidence has revealed that in practice, the effect of SSRI treatment is more complex and ultimately the heteroceptor will in turn undergo desensitization. This can manifest in negative symptoms regarding mood and cognition. The very different behavioral effects of binding at the heteroceptor versus the autoreceptor were clearly demonstrated in a 2017 study by Garcia Garcia et al. They took two different groups of mice and neither knocked out their heteroceptors or the autoreceptors. They discovered that mice lacking heteroceptors displayed depressive symptoms that were characteristic of anhedonia, in other words, a loss of drive for rewarding stimuli. Conversely, the mice that had their autoreceptors ablated experienced heightened anxiety but still possessed a hedonic drive. The loss of the heteroceptor and ensuing anhedonic symptoms poignantly mirror the effect of SSRIs in some patients. A similar pattern of lowered cortical activity was also found in mice treated with the SSRI paroxetine. What explains why some patients respond well to SSRIs whilst others don't? Well, it might be to do with individual genetics. Mutations on the SNPRS6295 can determine your individual resilience to heteroceptor desensitization and whether or not treatment with SSRIs might be more beneficial or not. The next question might be, how can the 1A receptor be resensitized? Well, pindololol is a beta blocker which also has been shown to act as an autoreceptor antagonist. The combined use of pindololol and SSRIs has been effective in countering some of the side effects relating to mood and sexual function. It appears pindololol could be preventing the receptor internalization and desensitization without interfering with some of the positive effects of SSRI treatment. To learn more about this topic and to review some of the studies mentioned in this video, go to www.secondlifeguides.com. There'll be a link in the description of the video.